are things that are, that I think are true. I admire things that I think are just. Because, because I've had a very difficult life, many difficult experiences in life as a black woman, this colors what I feel. There's many facets to the storied life of Elizabeth Catlett. She was the first person to graduate with a master's in fine art from the University of Iowa. She spent several years in Mexico, becoming friends with renowned artists like Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. She was an ardent communist, forced to flee the U.S. after the waves of McCarthyism that dominated the 50s. In a career filled with as much triumph as it did turmoil, one of her greatest strengths as an artist was harnessing that turmoil into her work not only born of her own personal experiences, but of the many shared experiences of black women in her epoch. At a time where their material roles often didn't extend further than motherhood or domestic servitude, Catlett's art provided a shining light of clarity, launching them from the invisible outskirts, often ignored by society, to a visible center stage. It was this act of simply reflecting their relations, documenting their everyday lives and truths that was cause enough for governments to be afraid, for her art to be considered dangerous. Her bold compositions are evidence of this. She's best known for her remarkable pieces that merge the political with the personal, from her striking linocut tableaus to her painstaking wood and stone-carved sculptures. Her art serves as the meeting ground between individual insight and historical record, a formidable union that makes her pieces even more emotionally resonant on a generational level. She placed particular focus on the face, the black female face, and all of its features and expressions. They serve not only as windows to identity and the soul, but as touchstones to understanding the intersections of misogyny, racism, and capitalism that have dominated the life of the black American woman in the country for centuries. A dialogue that would continue to echo through Catlett's work across her career. Her most notable series is this one, from 1946, titled The Negro Woman, a series of 15 astonishing lithograph prints, each accompanied by a phrase that together sketch out a narrative that depicts the everyday realities of black women throughout their history in America, from the earliest days of slavery to modern domestic labor and low-paying service work. We're presented with how the struggles and systems of black women's oppression have evolved in similar forms across generations, inherited trauma and status, or lack thereof, carry on through these many anonymous black figures, linked together by their shared identity and relationship to capital. She doesn't leave all of these black women anonymous though. Some are boldly declared as the historic figures we would recognize. Abolitionists like Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman make cameos in her pieces, with lines calling out their leadership and civil rights advocacy during slavery. And in another panel starring author Phyllis Wheatley, Catlett stresses the importance of education and intellectual equality in the life of the black woman, given just as much access as their white counterparts to higher learning, knowledge, and history. In these and her many other works, we're made to consider the expansive view of black womanhood, the many roles they took on in both service of a country that hated them, but also in service of their people. To live it all in America as a black woman is to engage in a daily act of rebellion. The Negro woman asks us to see black women as direct descendants who carry the struggles and legacy of the heroes who came before. And she found protagonists with stories worth telling in houseworkers, servants, and domestic laborers alike. It was her focus on underscoring class dynamics that made her pieces even more radical. She was acutely aware of the hardships Negro women faced that transformed their roles under capitalism, magnified by the misogynoir they already experienced. Hardships were able to access by way of the face that holds within it generational traumas and triumphs. The series was made during her first years in Mexico. Selected as a member of the Julius Rosenwald Fellowship, she was commissioned to produce these pieces in an effort to champion the fight for black women's democratic rights in America. It was during her time here she'd formed friendships with the many leftist painters, printmakers, and artists of Mexico's activist realm. 
from the likes of Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo to David Sequeiros and Jose Clemente Orozco. Indeed, many of them were some of the preeminent figures of the Mexican muralist movement of the 20s, where the Mexican government commissioned artists to create murals to educate illiterate populations about the country's pre-colonial history, as well as sketch out a powerful vision for its future. In these murals, even the lowliest workers are cast as protagonists, the heroes that would eventually forge Mexico's future. In bearing witness to the similarities in her struggles as a black woman in America, Catlett would transcribe many of these lessons into her own art, wishing to give black women just as much access to agency and beautiful forms they were ill-afforded in popular art of the period. Their collaborative influence would shape Catlett's radical work going forward. One of the many ways this collaboration manifested was in Taller de Grafica Popular, a leftist print organization, the home of Rivera, Orozco, and others, who merged art with activism, revealing printmaking as a politically conscious practice. A far cry from the expensive stationary murals of the 20s and 30s, printmaking art was cheap and easily reproducible, allowing leftist ideas and social causes to be more easily spread and championed throughout the country. It's in Taillere she would acquire more than just artistic skills, but a political community, a space built for them to talk about their problems and organize around revolutionary thought. Her connection to these radical leftist artists is part of why she would be listed as an undesirable alien and eventually barred from returning to the US until 2002. But it's also where she would produce some of her most prolific and engaging art, like Which Way? This piece is one of my favorites. There's so much hypnotic interplay here that focuses on gendered and racialized oppression, representative of the many faces black women have had to wear in their competing roles throughout this country's history, whether by choice or by necessity. Or Sharecropper, another lino cut piece detailing the lives of black women in the South, scarred by the inequitable tenant farming relationships that put black women in endless cycles of debt to greedy landlords. Originally made in linoleum, it would be years later Catlett would add color to the print version. Or in this other lino cut titled Survivor, detailing the lives of former slaves, the transitionary period from unpaid domestic servitude to low paying domestic servitude. It's representative of scars from the past that will never truly heal. Here in print form, it reads like the most evocative black and white photography, because it kind of is. Taking influence from this Dorothea Lange photograph, ex-slave with a long memory, a photographer responsible for this familiar photograph, Migrant Mother, there are striking similarities in their work. The stark black linocut reliefs serves as a detailed window into the lives of black womanhood, where Dorothea's work aimed to get government funding for needy families struck during the Great Depression, Catlett's work equally strived to uplift the plight of the black woman, make it inescapably apparent to audiences conditioned to look away. Her facial expression in Catlett's piece is just as hardened here. We're given access to the many lives she's lived, the magnitude of the struggle that she's endured. For Catlett, the face is the key to understanding more than just racial identity, but the inner essence of the human. Here we bear witness to the face of a former enslaved woman whose long memory of the evil in this country experienced firsthand has allowed her to survive its continual onslaught, and it's a long memory that extends further than her own. We're exposed to a kind of totality here. To understand your own history and legacy, stories passed down generations, you gain a kind of access to this long, documented memory as well. Catlett does more than simply find kinship or a story worth telling in this depiction of the ex-enslaved, but as the granddaughter of former slaves herself, she finds family, a direct align to who she could have been in a different time. It's a piece where the immense weight of history becomes synonymous with our memory. But perhaps her greatest work, the greatest synthesis of her personal experience and the storied history she saw as integral to document, is this sculpture, titled Mother and Child. The tenderness depicted in this figure escapes analysis. It is gentle but also protective, imbued somehow with a vulnerability contained in her forms that immediately speak to their black identities. The figure's tranquil repose in this familiar position, synonymous with motherhood, is astonishing. The child's face resting tenderly against her chest. It's a piece that's as soothing as it is strong. The curling intimacy found in the child gives way to the stability rooted in the legs of the mother. They're composed in this triangular form, common in Madonna and child depictions, because that's what this is, the Madonna and child recontextualized, recast with black figures with black features. 
in it were made privy to the love a mother has for her child, as well as the protection and strength that emanates. It's a piece that was doubtlessly informed by her own experiences as a mother. We know this because this wasn't the first time she had attempted this. Catlett had made a comparable structure for her thesis project back in Iowa. The differences are immediately apparent and understood. The work is more unrefined, the faces are looser, pulled back, less focused to a degree. Their pose is similar, but not nearly as striking. This would be expected. Her artistry greatly improved over the years. A major technique she learned from Francisco Zuniga in Mexico was how to use terracotta coils as the base of her forms and sculpture, making the form easily workable and more structurally sound. But more than just an artist simply getting better from a technical standpoint, her 1956 Madonna shows someone harnessing their lived experience into art. Through comparison, it's a kind of recognition of art as a lifelong pursuit. It takes a generation before the raw, unfinished form can be fully realized. It takes a lifetime lived. After all, it was a piece that not only came after technique and experience gleaned from artists in New York and Mexico, but also after a visit to the Jim Crow South, witnessing the dehumanization and systemic violence that occupied the region on a grand scale. It would come after producing notable work like The Negro Woman, a history lesson that detailed the plight of black womanhood and its heroines both historic and modern. It would come after she was labeled an undesirable alien by the country she was born in and forced to flee. It would come after she became a mother herself. All of these lessons culminate in her 1956 rendition. It's a moment of reprieve, a space to contemplate and care for our loved ones, a space removed from the horrors black American women and children have experienced, but also informed by them. It's the epitome of multifaceted black womanhood, the most tender form and manifests as. It's a piece that was also produced only a year after the lynching of Emmett Till, with Mammy Till rejecting attempts to cover up the brutality insisting on an open casket funeral, showing the reality of his gruesome murder for all to see, the photographs of his beaten face massacred beyond recognition. With this powerful, clarifying lens, the sculpture's strength and purpose is made crystal clear here. It depicts holding those we love close, our children, our black children that in this world so often don't get to grow old. It's no wonder why she would depict this mother and child relationship again and again and again. It's through even the most basic and universal relationships were exposed and made vulnerable all over again, exposed to the political content inherent in all art, so wrapped up in our individual identities and histories that it's inseparable from who we are. Catlett's art revealed so much about the black woman to America, underappreciated in the roles they served in a country that hates them, as abolitionists and authors, as low-paid workers and mothers, and like Catlett, as artists intent on documenting the radical but simple truths of her time, allowing us to bear witness to them with the stark clarity that she had. In a pose or a form or even a face, entire histories are encoded and entire generations transcended. It's here we're made capable of realizing not just ancestral struggles as connected to our own, but the multifaceted struggles of others as well. The oppressed people of the world, who across the history of working class depictions and art, are stylized as the radical heroes who will undoubtedly usher in its future. The greatest artists of our time were acutely aware of this. They spoke this truth vividly, whispered it into the paints and inks somehow, while beholding their works in the light of the radical legacies they left behind, we see even more clearly than they did. Mind Theater is a solo effort produced and written by me, Ewakin Bade. For only $3 a month, you could support the show on Patreon. It really helps a lot. The link is in the description box below. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. <laughs>